Now, this is quite a discovery. Fragments of a biblical scroll, along with other relics, have been found in desert caves in Israel. 90% of the Old Testament's been removed, and about 50% of the New Testament's been removed. Missing books in the Holy Bible exposed. The word apocrypha comes from the Greek language and means hidden or secret. Initially, it meant sacred books that were considered too sacred or esoteric for the general public to know. These 15 books, which are mostly of Jewish origin and are found in the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and include parts of two Esdras that may be of Christian and Latin origin. What secrets might be hidden in these books, and why were these 15 books of the Apocrypha hidden? Where can they be found? Join us as we explore 15 hidden banned books of the Bible. These books were not hidden in the sense of being intentionally hidden, but rather they were not universally accepted in the Jewish or Protestant Old Testament canons. They can be found in some versions of the Bible, particularly in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox traditions, where they are called the Deuterocanonical books. These include the first and second books of Ezra, the books of Maccabees, Baruch, Bel and the Dragon, Ecclesiastes, Esther, including additional chapters, Judith, the Prayer of Manasseh, the Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, Susanna, Tobit, and Wisdom. The books of the Apocrypha were written several centuries ago, during a time when Jewish culture was heavily influenced by Greek language and customs. But when exactly were they written? The Apocrypha isn't just one single work. It's a collection of diverse books penned over a long period, roughly between 400 and 200 BCE. One reason these books may not have been considered Holy Scripture by some is that they were written relatively recently compared to other biblical texts. Additionally, the historical period in which they were written was sometimes seen as problematic, adding to the debate about their spiritual authority and place in the Bible. The Hellenistic period, spanning from the death of Alexander the Great to just before the first century CE, 323 BCE-32 BCE, was a time when Jews in Palestine and the Diaspora absorbed a significant amount of Greek language and culture. As a result, many Jewish religious texts from this period were written in Greek rather than Hebrew. For example, the entire New Testament was written in Greek. Some Jews may have viewed these Greek writings as less authentic compared to those written in Hebrew. Interestingly, expressions and images from the Apocrypha were incorporated into the New Testament. However, it's unclear if the New Testament authors were directly familiar with the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is closely tied to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, which was frequently quoted by New Testament writers. Because of this, the Septuagint became well known primarily through Christian references rather than Jewish ones, as Jewish scribes mostly wrote in Hebrew. Many New Testament authors used expressions and imagery from the Apocrypha. Scholars debate whether these authors were directly reading apocryphal books, or if the stories were already part of Jewish culture in the first century. For example, both Paul and the anonymous author of Hebrews use imagery similar to that found in the apocryphal book, The Wisdom of Solomon. Additionally, Hebrews 11.35-37 references the martyrdom story from 2 Maccabees. These references suggest that some early Christians may have considered these books canonical. The apocrypha was indeed known by the early church fathers and frequently quoted by them. While New Testament authors may have alluded to these books, Several early church fathers quoted directly from them. For example, the late first century document Fars Clement quotes from the Wisdom of Solomon. The Epistle of Barnabas, another early Christian text, quotes from several apocryphal books, and the early church father Polycarp referred to a story from the apocryphal additions to the Book of Daniel. This widespread use and acceptance by the early church suggest that many early Christians regarded the apocryphal books as scripture. This historical acceptance is one reason why Catholic Bibles include the Apocrypha, giving these books a distinct section. While the Catholic Church does not consider the Apocrypha to be inspired scripture, they are still seen as valuable and beneficial for reading and study. In contrast, 
Other forms of the Christian Bible, such as Protestant versions, typically do not include the Apocrypha. These books are also not fully accepted by Jewish tradition, which has a different set of criteria for what constitutes Holy Scripture. Jewish Views on the Books of the Apocrypha The exact timing of when the Hebrew Bible canon was solidified is unclear. Early rabbinic writings mention only one apocryphal book, Sirach, and seem to be unaware of the others. This might be because the apocryphal books were primarily available in Greek, even though some were translated from Aramaic or Hebrew. Additionally, there is evidence suggesting that early rabbinic writers may have viewed the apocryphal books as contradicting some principles of the Hebrew Bible. This could be another reason these books were not included in the Jewish canon. The list and summary of these books is explained below along with their composition date. The Banned Book of Tobit, written around 225-175 BCE, this story follows Tobit, a blind man living in Nineveh, and Sarah, a woman in Ecbatana. Tobit sends his son, Tobias, to collect some money he left in another city. An angel named Raphael guides Tobias to Sarah, who is tormented by a demon. Raphael saves her, and Tobias marries Sarah. They return to Tobit, who miraculously regains his sight. The Illegal Book of Judith Written around 100 BCE, this is the tale of Judith, a brave Jewish widow. When her city is under siege by an Assyrian general, she uses her charm to gain his trust. After he gets drunk, she decapitates him, saving Jerusalem from destruction. Esther Saves Israel from Mass Execution Written around 115 BCE, Esther tells the story of a Jewish woman who prevents a Persian plot to annihilate her people. While the Hebrew version of Esther is a recognized part of the Bible, the Greek version includes additional sections. These additions mention God more than 50 times and delve into the character's inner thoughts, unlike the Hebrew version, which doesn't mention God at all. The Holy Wisdom of Solomon Written around 50 BCE, this book highlights the importance of wisdom in relation to humans and God. It may have influenced the famous opening of the Gospel of John, where wisdom is replaced by the Word. The Sacred Book of Syrac or Ecclesiasticus, written around 200-175 BCE, this book is unique because we know its author, Jesus, son of Syrac. His grandson, Ben Syra translated it from Hebrew to Greek and added a prologue. The book focuses entirely on ethical teachings and wise sayings. Baruch captures account of Jewish exile. Written between 200-100 BCE, this book contains reflections by a Jewish writer on the exiles of Jews from Babylon. It delves into themes of theology and wisdom offering thoughtful insights on the experiences and faith of the Jewish people during these tough times. Now just very quick, if it's your first time here on my channel, I would appreciate if you would like the video so that you can help me to continue spreading Christian messages. Subscribe and also click that notification bell so you won't miss any of the next videos that are uploaded every day. All right, let's keep rolling. Three Holy Children Thrown Into a Furnace From the 1st century BCE, this story is an addition to the Book of Daniel. It begins with a prayer by Azariah, also known as Abednego, when he and his friends Shadrach and Meshach are thrown into a fiery furnace. The second part describes an angelic figure appearing in the furnace with them, protecting them from the flames. The third part is a hymn praising God for their miraculous rescue. Susanna Almost Executed for Refusing Sex Written between 333-160 BCE, this addition to Daniel tells the story of Susanna, a married woman falsely accused by two elders after she refuses their advances. They claim she had an affair with a young man, leading to her arrest. Just as she is about to be executed, the prophet Daniel intervenes, exposing the elders' lies. Susanna is saved, and the false accusers are executed instead. 
The Chilling Story of Bell and the Dragon, written between 200-100 BCE, this story is also an addition to Daniel. It begins with the king of Babylon claiming that the idol of the god Bell eats and drinks the offerings made to him. Daniel reveals that it is actually the priests who are consuming the offerings. In the second part, the king presents a dragon as a god. Daniel kills the dragon without a sword by feeding it poisonous food, proving it is not a god. The Prayer of Manasseh From the 1st or 2nd century BCE, this is a brief but powerful prayer attributed to King Manasseh of Judah. In the Hebrew Bible, Manasseh worships idols and is captured by the king of Assyria. In captivity, he prays for mercy. This prayer is believed to be his actual plea to God, and upon his release, he renounces idol worship. 1 Maccabees Written around 100 BCE, this book tells the exciting story of the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire, King Antiochus IV. Epiphanes tried to force Jews to abandon their traditions and embrace Greek culture. The Maccabees, a group of Jewish rebels, fought back to preserve their heritage. Q. Maccabees Written between 150-100 BCE, this book continues the tale of the Maccabean Revolt. It highlights the struggles and victories of the Jewish rebels, ending with the triumph of Judas Maccabeus over the Seleucid Empire, ensuring Jewish religious freedom. Warn Esdras Written in the 2nd century BCE, this is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Book of Ezra. It closely follows the original, detailing the return of the Jews from Babylonian exile and the rebuilding of the temple. However, it omits stories of Nehemiah and adds some new material. Su Esdras, written between 70 to 218 CE, this is an apocalyptic Jewish text from the 1st to 3rd centuries CE. The author, claiming to be the ancient scribe Ezra, shares visions and prophecies about the end times, reflecting the anxieties and hopes of the Jewish people during this period. The puzzle of why these books were removed from most Bibles can be explained by several reasons. Late composition. These books were written later than other biblical texts, which made some people think they were too recent to be considered Holy Scripture. Language barrier. They were written in Greek, not Hebrew, which made some Jewish scholars skeptical. Additionally, some content in these books didn't align with earlier Jewish teachings. Because of these factors, the acceptance of the Apocrypha is inconsistent among Christians. General Christian view, most Christian Bibles do not include the Apocrypha. Catholic view, Catholic Bibles include the Apocrypha in a separate section. Catholics encourage reading these books, but emphasize that they are not considered divinely inspired scripture. We are going to broadly explain the constituents of the second Esdras. Come and take a look. The Apocrypha. Second Ezra. Come and explore the fascinating book of Second Ezra, also known as Second Esdras, or Latin Ezra. This ancient text, attributed to the scribe and priest Ezra from the 5th century BCE, is part of the Apocrypha, a collection of books included in some versions of the Bible, but not in others. Second Ezra is an apocalyptic book, meaning it deals with revelations about the end times and the future. It gained prominence after Jerusalem fell to the Romans in AD 70, offering hope and insight during a time of despair. The book was left out of the Vulgate, a key Latin version of the Bible, by Jerome, but from the 9th century onwards, it started to appear as an appendix, becoming more widely included by the 13th century. The central theme of Second Ezra is understanding and justifying God's ways to humanity. It delves into profound questions about life, the universe, and the divine plan, making it a significant text for those interested in Jewish and Christian traditions and their historical contexts. Contents of 2 Esdras, 4 Esdras in some versions, 2 Esdras, also known as 4 Esdras, in certain Bible translations, begins with Ezra recounting how the Lord instructed him to warn the people about their forgetfulness of God. Chapter 1 serves as an opening where Ezra conveys this divine message to the people, urging them to remember their faith and relationship with God. 
Chapter 1 In ancient times there was a prophet named Ezra. He had a son named Sarah, who had a son named Azariah, and so on, tracing back through their family history. God spoke to Ezra's descendant, saying, Go and tell my people about their wrongdoings and their children about the sins they've committed against me. They've forgotten me and worship other gods, even though I rescued them from slavery in Egypt. They've angered me by disobeying my laws. They are rebellious. How long can I tolerate them after all I've done for them? I defeated their enemies, including Pharaoh and his army. I led them safely through the sea, provided leaders like Moses and Aaron, and showed them miracles. Yet they have forgotten me, says the Lord. The Lord Almighty said, Remember how I provided quail for you and set up camps to protect you. Despite this, you complained. When you were hungry and thirsty in the wilderness, you complained to me, saying it would have been better to stay in Egypt. But I showed mercy and gave you manna to eat, angel's food. When you were thirsty, I made water flow from a rock for you and provided shade with tree branches from the heat. I gave you fertile lands and drove out your enemies. What more could I have done for you? The Lord Almighty said, When you were in the wilderness, thirsty and complaining, I didn't punish you for your disrespect. Instead, I made bitter water sweet by throwing a tree into it. But now, Jacob and Judah, you refuse to obey me. I will turn to other nations who will honor me and keep my laws. Because you have abandoned me, I will abandon you. When you cry out to me for mercy, I will not answer. Your hands are stained with blood, and you rush into violence. It's not that you've abandoned me, you've abandoned yourselves, says the Lord. The Lord Almighty said, Haven't I treated you like a caring father treats his children, or a mother her babies? I wanted you to be my people, and I your God, like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But now, I will cast you out from my presence. When you bring sacrifices to me, I will turn away, because I reject your festivals and rituals. I sent you my prophets, but you killed them. Their blood will be on your hands, says the Lord. The Lord Almighty continued, Your homes will be empty, like straw blown away by the wind, because you have disobeyed me. I will give your houses to a people who will obey me without needing signs. They haven't seen prophets, but they will remember the past. I will bless them, and they will believe in me with their spirit, even though they haven't seen me with their eyes. Now, look with pride, Father, at the people coming from the east. I will appoint leaders for them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and many prophets, to guide them, says the Lord. Chapter 2 continues. The Lord said to Ezra, I rescued these people from slavery and gave them commandments through my prophets, but they ignored them and rejected my advice. Like a grieving mother, I say to them, Go away, my children, because I am alone and abandoned. I raised you with joy, but now I mourn because you have sinned against the Lord and done evil. What more can I do for you? I am alone and abandoned. Go, my children, and seek mercy from the Lord. I call upon heaven and earth as witnesses against you, because you broke my covenant. May you be confused and ruined with no descendants. Let them be scattered among the nations, their names forgotten, for they have rejected my covenant. Woe to you, Assyria, who harbor the wicked. Remember what I did to Sodom and Gomorrah, whose land is still desolate. The same fate awaits those who refuse to listen says the Lord Almighty. The Lord said to Ezra, Tell my people that I will give them the kingdom of Jerusalem, which I intended for Israel. I will restore their glory and give them an everlasting home. They will enjoy the fragrance of the tree of life and never grow weary. Ask, and you will receive. Pray for shorter days. The kingdom is ready for you. Heaven and earth witness this. I reject evil and create good because I am the living God, says the Lord. Mothers, embrace your sons with joy like doves. I have chosen you. I will raise the dead from their tombs because I know them by name. Do not fear, mothers of sons, for I have chosen you, says the Lord. I will send you help through my servants Isaiah and Jeremiah. 
I have prepared twelve fruit-bearing trees, springs of milk and honey, and seven mountains where roses and lilies grow. Your children will rejoice in these. Protect the widow's rights, secure justice for the fatherless, help the needy, defend the orphan, clothe the naked, care for the injured and weak, respect the disabled and provide for the elderly and young. Bury the dead with honor. They will rise first in my resurrection. Rest quietly, my people. Your peace will come. Good nurses will care for your sons and strengthen them. None of my servants will perish. I will call them back from your midst. Do not worry. In times of trouble, you will rejoice while others suffer. Nations will envy you, but they cannot harm you, says the Lord. I will protect you so your children will not suffer in Gehenna. Rejoice, mothers, for I will deliver you, says the Lord. Remember your sleeping children. I will bring them back from the earth and show them mercy, because I am merciful, says the Lord Almighty. Embrace your children until I come with mercy, for my grace overflows. I, Ezra, received a command from the Lord on Mount Horeb to go to Israel. When I went to them, they rejected me and disobeyed the Lord's command. So now, I say to all nations who hear and understand, await your shepherd, who will bring you everlasting rest. The one who comes at the end of the age is near. Prepare for the rewards of the kingdom, where eternal light will shine on you forever. Leave behind the troubles of this world and embrace the joy of your glory. I call upon my Savior to witness this. Receive what the Lord has given you with joy thanking him for calling you to heavenly kingdoms. Rise and stand at the feast of the Lord, where those who are sealed will be counted. Those who have left the troubles of this world behind have received glorious garments from the Lord. Zion, gather your people who follow the Lord's law, clothed in white. Your desired number of children is complete. Pray to the Lord's power that your people, chosen from the beginning, may be made holy. Ezra describes a vision he had on Mount Zion, where he saw a vast multitude of people praising the Lord with songs. Among them was a young man of great stature, taller than anyone else. This young man was placing crowns on the heads of the people in the multitude, symbolizing their honor and victory. Despite the multitude receiving crowns, this young man was even more exalted than they were, captivating Ezra's attention. Curious about the identity of the young man, Ezra asked an angel who these people were. The angel explained that they were those who had shed their mortal bodies and put on immortal ones. They had confessed the name of God faithfully during their lives and were now being crowned and given palm branches, symbols of victory and honor. Ezra then inquired about the identity of the young man placing the crowns and palms. The angel revealed that he was the Son of God, whom these faithful individuals had confessed and honored during their lives. Filled with awe and admiration, Ezra praised those who had courageously stood firm in their faith and loyalty to the Lord throughout their lives. This passage from Ezra reflects themes of faithfulness, divine reward, and the exaltation of those who remain steadfast in their devotion to God ultimately receiving eternal honor and glory in his presence. The concern over disputed or missing books like those in the Apocrypha does not diminish the trust in God's word. Christians believe that scripture, as it has been preserved and transmitted, remains faithful to God's message. Jesus himself affirmed the authority and reliability of the Old Testament scriptures and Christians trust in his ability to oversee the preservation of his word throughout history. The Bible is considered self-attesting and distinct from other writings like the books of the Apocrypha. While these books may contain historical or helpful content, they are not regarded as inspired or authoritative scripture like the books in the Protestant canon. The scriptures are seen as uniquely God-breathed, having a transformative power that sets them apart from other writings. Despite debates over additional texts, the 66 books of the Bible are viewed as sufficient for faith and practice. Christians can have confidence that these books constitute God's word and carry his authority, offering spiritual guidance and truth that is enduring and effective. 
In essence, the trust in the Bible stems from its divine inspiration, its ability to impact lives, and its role as the authoritative source of God's revelation to humanity. Ancient Texts and Faith We began discussing various passages from ancient texts, particularly focusing on passages attributed to Ezra. These texts often deal with themes of faithfulness, divine judgment, and the relationship between God and his people. Concerns about missing books. You expressed concerns some Christians have about the inclusion or exclusion of certain books, such as those found in the Apocrypha. There's worry that this might affect the completeness of God's word, assurance in God's word. In response, it was emphasized that the trust in Scripture is ultimately rooted in Jesus Christ and his affirmation of the Old Testament Scriptures. Despite debates over additional texts like those in the Apocrypha, Christians believe that God has overseen the preservation of his word throughout history. The Authority of Scripture We discussed how Christians view the Bible as self-attesting, meaning it carries its own authority due to its divine inspiration. This sets it apart from other ancient writings, which may contain valuable insights, but are not considered on par with the canonical scriptures. Sufficiency of the Bible The Protestant belief in the sufficiency of the 66 books of the Bible was highlighted. These books are seen as containing everything necessary for faith and practice, offering spiritual guidance and truth that is enduring and effective. Confidence in God's providence. Finally, we affirmed that Christians can have confidence in God's ability to govern history in such a way that his word is preserved and communicated faithfully. This assurance rests on the belief that God, who orchestrated events like the birth of Jesus at the right time, is capable of ensuring the reliability and authority of scripture. The statement about the sufficiency of the 66 books of the Bible reflects a traditional Protestant perspective. This viewpoint asserts that these books contain the complete revelation of God's will for salvation and Christian living. The belief is that God has providentially ensured the preservation and inclusion of these specific books to convey his message to humanity. Regarding the hidden portion of the Bible, such as texts found in the Apocrypha or other ancient writings not included in the Protestant canon, different Christian traditions have varying perspectives. Protestant Perspective Many Protestant Christians hold that the 66 books in their Bible are sufficient and complete. They may view the Apocrypha or other ancient texts as valuable for historical and cultural context, but not inspired scripture. This perspective emphasizes the uniqueness and authority of the canonical books. Catholic and Orthodox Perspectives In contrast, Catholic and Orthodox Christians include additional books in their Old Testament canons, known as the Deuterocanonical Books, or the Apocrypha. These books are considered part of inspired scripture and are read and studied alongside the rest of the Bible. Historical and Scholarly Considerations Scholars and historians study these ancient texts, including the Apocrypha, for insights into religious practices, beliefs, and historical contexts of ancient Judaism and early Christianity. These texts provide valuable background to understanding the development of religious thought and practice in antiquity. In conclusion, perspectives on the sufficiency of the Bible and the inclusion of additional texts vary among different Christian traditions and scholarly communities. The belief in the sufficiency of the 66 books of the Bible for faith and practice remains a cornerstone of Protestant theology, emphasizing the unique authority and transformative power of Scripture. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share with your friends so we can keep making them. For more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and remember to click on the notification bell. Also, be sure to check out our other videos as well. Thanks for watching.